Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Get It Right. My name is Susan Mwangi, your host. Today we will be discussing about animals welfare and with me today is uh, Dr. Mwenda Mbaka who is an external affairs advisor for World Animal Protection in Africa. Dr. Mwenda Mbaka, welcome to the show and tell us more about yourself. Uh, thank you, Susan, for inviting us to this show, uh, to this show. Yes, my name is uh, Mwenda Mbaka. I am a veterinarian. Um, I am the external affairs advisor for World Animal Protection Africa, like you have said. I'm also the immediate former chairman of the Kenya Veterinary Board. Um, World Animal Protection is a global organization that uh, aims to move people to protect animals from unnecessary suffering. This derives from the fact that it is quite clear to us and using scientific evidence that animal suffering not only causes discomfort to the animal, pain to the animals, unnecessary suffering to the animals, but then also it makes it uh, difficult for human beings to derive the benefits that you would expect from the animals. So um, the scope of uh, our work as wild animal protection covers animals in farming, whereby currently in our strategic plan for this duration until next year, we are focusing on broilers and pigs. And then we look at animals in communities, whereby we are looking at uh, animals that are not food animals and you know like working animals but specifically our focus at this particular moment is the dogs in what ways are dogs like you mentioned you no know, the the dogs and the poultry and the pigs in what ways could farmers be maybe oppressing them without even their knowledge um many things are not right about animals first of all let us remember that uh, people are socialized to believe that animals were created in order to serve them because people consume animals without the intention of uh, violating anybody's faith. And if the basis of that kind of argument is from the fact that animals, we use animals for food, to work for us, to get uh, wealth, to get materials from them, what do you say about mosquitoes that feed on us? Can the mos mosquitoes it would the mosquitoes be right to say that human beings were created for mosquitoes to feed on them. So the point I'm raising here is that there is a, an interrelationship with all living beings that needs to be respected in the sense that uh, people tend to look at animals as just animals and therefore they're not conscious about the fact that animals suffer emotionally like people do, animals suffer physically like we do, they feel uncomfortable if it's cold, they feel uncomfortable if it's too hot. They feel, they feel uncomfortable if they're hungry. They feel fear. They feel anxiety. You see what happens when somebody takes away chicks from a hen. The distress it gets into. Or a puppy from a dog. You see the distress it goes to. So there are many ways in which people distress and mostly cause them stress without their awareness because people do not recognize the fact that animals are as sentient as we are. In other words, they can feel pain, physical pain and emotional pain. And uh, to make it uh, very understandable to us and to our viewers, how does that affect productivity? Um, let us look at it this way. What happens to human beings when they get stressed? Like now, if I've heard that there's a problem or there is fear. I hear that there's something that causes fear to me. You notice that my heart rate goes high. My blood pressure goes high. I become more alert. You find that I feel hot. There are so many changes that happen. You feel your heart beating faster. All these things are caused by a hormone you call cortisol. And many other factors out of, you know, that are related to the stress that happens. So now, the challenge here is that when animals are under stress, this hormone expresses itself. And when it expresses itself, it causes many things not to be right. For instance, you feed an animal because you expect it to convert those nutrients into the eggs you're expecting from the animal. 
you expect the animal to convert the feed you give into meat, into milk, into fur, into calves, and so on. Now, science shows us that when you stress an animal, when that cortisol levels go up, first of all, there's diversion of blood supply from the digestive system. So you've given the animal the feed, and therefore it's not able to digest it effectively and efficiently to convert it to what you expect. Cortisol reduces the rate of absorption. Cortisol reduces, uh, I mean, alters metabolism. Metabolism is normally what happens how the food is converted in the body into the things that you expect from the animal. <clears throat> Therefore, what you're saying there, it affects productivity in what sense. If you stress the animal, cortisol prepares the animal to deal with the source of stress, which means that the blood is diverted from the things that are not essential for survival at that particular moment into resources that enable the animal to survive. So you find that the blood is diverted into the muscles, to the brain, to the eyes, to the heart, you know, the heartbeat and so all that, and all those other factors. So because there is less blood supply to the digestive system, ultimately, productivity of the animal goes down. Acute stress will do that. Now, chronic stress, if the animal, like say, the animal is in an uncomfortable environment, if the animal is in a blood place, the animal is consistently stressed, like the way most of these animals are kept, they are caged, they are kept in very uncomfortable conditions. What happens is that is a, is a, is a cortisol levels are generally and continuously high. So you find that productivity goes down. Whereby, if the animals are kept well, then they're able to convert the feed you give them, them very efficiently into the products that you want. The animal is living a good, happy life, and you're getting what you expect from it. And what you're saying, just to affirm what you're saying, we've been to farms whereby a farmer will tell you that they have fed their livestock properly, they have ensured, you know, they've made sure that the vaccinations are done in time, but then that's, that is not reflecting in the productivity. So could this, could this be the reason? You know, the stress, probably the, the way the animal is being kept. What are some of these ways that could actually really directly affect? Let talk, let's talk in the terms of uh, dairy, dairy cows. Yes, where the farmer is feeding the cow very well, but then the milk is still really not the expected you know, amount. Let us first of all, uh, Susan, understand what animal welfare is. Yes. Putting it simply from a scientific point of view, because animal welfare is about science, it is a physical well-being of the animal, it is a physiological well-being of the animal, and the psychological well-being of the animal. What are we talking about physical? The animal is free of injuries. The animal is not having infections. It's not having parasites. How does that come to physical? Remember, when, when an animal has got a disease, the pathogens are actually causing destruction of the cells. And those cells is where the processes, the life processes happen in the animal. That's what we're talking about physiological well-being. So the cells are the cells should be in, you know, physically, the integrity should be protected. Point number one. So animals that get sick, treat them immediately. Sickness is going to cause damage to animals, cause the cells, and so the animals are not going to perform efficiently. If an animal has got an injury, which is exposing it now to the, first of all, the pain, and then secondly, also, that's where germs can enter the animal and so on. Now, let's look at the physiological component of this. When you feed the animal, the nutrients are absorbed through the physiological processes, let them call them that because that's a language, through the physiological processes that happen into the, in the animal, then those uh, nutrients are now converted into the tissues. It is converted into what now makes you able to get the milk and the eggs and so on. So if you don't feed the animal well, it means that you're not going to get what you expected. Now, the psychological well-being of the animal, what are we talking about? The processes that happen in the cells of the animal, anything that happens, including movement, including feeling hungry and looking for food, all those things are controlled by the brain. Therefore, if there is something that is disrupting the functioning of the brain, if there is something that is making the animal be psychologically unstable, for instance, when it is in fear, it's anxious, it's feeling hot, it's feeling cold, all those stresses will translate in malfunctioning of the entire body. So when you're talking about animal welfare, when you're talking about what the farmer expects to the animal, make sure that your animal gets treated as soon as it gets sick, 
protect his physical well-being from injuries, from infections, from all those things. Protect his physiological well-being. Provide it sufficient food. Provide it sufficient water. Provide it what it requires. And then make sure that that animal is not suffering any psychological, is not anxious. Like you see, there is this tendency, there's no science that is showing clearly that, you know, normally what you do is that an animal produces a calf. You know, a cow produces a calf, you take the calf away. There are some people now who are letting the calf stay with the, with, the, with the mother. And they realize that ultimately they get more milk, and the, animal, the calf grows faster, and they get ultimately the benefits are more. Now, you give an animal as much food as, you know, like now, say the cow, you're asking about the cow, but I also bring in the chicken, and also bring in the pigs. Give them all the feed that you want. Part of psychological well-being is an animal being able to be an animal. It is us, you don't want just to eat and sleep, you want to eat and interact with people. Animals need to interact with other animals, yeah? You don't want just to eat and sit in a place which is very sweaty. You need to be able to be comfortable physically. You don't want just to eat and then you're studying in Matope, you know, in the marketplace. Look at what people do to, to animals. You don't want to feed the animal very well, then it is lying down on a very hard surface. So you find that the animal, those, those stresses, you don't want to eat very well, but you get sick and you don't go to hospital. Or when you go to hospital, you are taken to a quack. So the treatment is not effective. So now you see what is happening here, Susan, is that people distress the animals so much that you find sometimes they compensate by treating the animals when they get sick or by putting antibiotics consistently in. And why do the animals get sick more often when they are stressed? Because one of the effects of cortisol is, as I took it, it diverts blood from the intestinal tract for digestion, also you do not need to uh, be protected from uh, disease now, now, when you're, in, a, when you're in, a, in an emergency situation. So there's a diversion of blood from the immune system. Therefore, it causes what you call immunosuppression, stress. Cortisol causes immunosuppression. Those animals get sick more often. They, basically, they get sick more often, yeah? And you know what that means? The farmer spends more. The animal cells are being destroyed, so it cannot perform as efficiently, and so on. So there are many reasons why that you find that farmers will give the animals feed, but the animals are not performing as expected. The genetics are correct. The environment, everything else is okay, except you're not, coping, you're not tackling the stress factors around the animal. And then how do we strike a balance then? Because we have uh, agricultural practices that have introduced, you know, uh, ways in which we can maximize on the space that farmers have, which of course have brought to introduction of the cage, you know, like where we have the, the battery pigs, cage. The cages for pigs, I mean, yes, exactly. Uh, so yeah, so. Um, Susan, science is dynamic. There are many things we knew in the past, we thought we knew. But the new evidence is coming to show us some things we thought were correct are changing. Point number one, I would like to emphasize that the farmer needs to consult the agricultural experts, the extension officers, the veterinarians, the people who will guide them on what the book says to be the correct spacing, you know, the environment for the animal. Point number one. Point number two, those scientists themselves need to update themselves with the emerging facts. And we have a very good uh, resource, Google, for instance. If you Google today, you'll find that things like the battery cage system are being abandoned in Europe. Like now in Europe and some other countries, it is now by law that chicken are no longer being produced in battery cage systems. Okay, you go produce your chicken, but that, those eggs will not get into the market. So what are you producing it for? And remember, those multinationals in Europe, they are now here in Africa. So also you find that that wave is coming here very soon. One of the things we do at World Animal Protection is that we support the Africa Union through the Africa Union Inter, Africa Bureau for Animal Resources, IAUIBA, is a technical arm of, uh, of the Africa Union on matters to do with livestock. World Animal Protection, we support them in things to do with animal welfare. We participate in what now is called the Africa Platform for Animal Welfare, which is the Secretariat is the AUIBA. And 
in Europe, they have the European platform for animal welfare. You know that Africa Union, Africa generally, we are looking at ourselves as a global community. Therefore, some treaties which have been passed in Europe, which now science proves to us that are necessary for us also to do, we are adopting the same, and even sometimes they're also adopting things from us, which we find to be good. Therefore, what's happening here? That wave of abolishing the use of the battery kit systems, whether it is for pigs, it is for chicken, it is for cattle, that caging animals into very little spaces, that is coming to an end. I feel there is so much to talk about the animal welfare Absolutely. and we are, in a short way we will be looking at the importance of the animal welfare where public health is concerned. Uh, but for now we are going to take a short break but don't go too far, we will be back in a short while.